When I use a word, Humpty Dumpty said in a rather scornful tone, it means just what I chose to mean, neither more nor less. The question is, said Alice, whether you can make words mean so many different things. The question is, said Humpty Dumpty, which is to be master, that's all. Alice was too much puzzled to say anything, so after a minute, Humpty Dumpty began again. They have a temper, some of them particularly verbs. They're the proudest of adjectives you can do anything with, but not verbs. However, I can manage the whole lot of them. Impenetrability, that's what I say. Would you tell me, please, said Alice, what that means? Now you talk like a reasonable child, said Humpty Dumpty, looking very much pleased. I meant by impenetrability that we've had enough of that subject, and that it would be just as well if you'd mention what you mean to do next, as I suppose you don't mean to stop here all the rest of your life. That's a great deal to make of one word mean, Alice said in a thoughtful tone. When I make a word do a lot of words like that, said Humpty Dumpty, I always pay it extra. Oh, said Alice, she was too much puzzled to make any other remark. Ah, oh, you should see him come round for me a Saturday night, Humpty Dumpty went on, wagging his head gravely from side to side. For to get their wages, you know, Alice didn't venture to ask what he paid them with, and so you see, I can't tell you. You seem very clever at explaining words, said Alice. Would you kindly tell me the meaning of the poem Jabberwocky? Let's hear it, said Humpty Dumpty. I can explain all the poems that ever were invented, and a good many that haven't been invented just yet. This sounded very hopeful, so Alice repeated the first verse. "'Twas brillig, and the slithy toves did gyre and jimble in the wabe. All mimsy were the broad groves, and the moam wraths outgrabe." That's enough to begin with, Humpty Dumpty interrupted. There are plenty of harsh words there. Brillig means four o'clock in the afternoon, the time when you begin broiling things for dinner. That's, that'll do very well, said Alice. And slithy, well, slithy means lithe and slimy. Lithe is the same as active, you see. It's like a portmanteau. There are two meanings packed up into one word. You see it now, Alice remarked thoughtfully. And what are the troves? Oh, well, toves are something like badgers, they're something like lizards, and they're something like corkscrews. They must be very curious-looking creatures. They are, that, said Humpty Dumpty. Also, they make their nests under sundials. Also, they live on cheese. And what's to gyre and to jimble? To gyre is to go around and round a, a gyroscope. To jimble is to make holes like a gimlet. And the wade is the grass plot round a sundial, I suppose, said Alice, surprised by her own ingenuity. Of course it is. It's called wabe, you know, because it goes a long way before it and a long way behind it, and a long way beyond it on each side, Alice added. Exactly so. Well, then, Mimsy is flimsy and miserable. There's another portmanteau for you, and a borer grove is a thin, shabby-looking bird with its feathers sticking out all around, something like a live mop. And then momraths, said Alice, was, I'm afraid I'm giving you a great deal of trouble. Well, a wrath is a sort of a green pig, but mom I'm not certain about. I think it's a short for, for home, meaning that they'd lost their way, you know. And what does outgrabe mean? Well, outgribing is something between bellowing and whistling with a kind of sneeze in the middle. However, you'll hear it done maybe down in the wood yonder, and when you've heard once you'll be quite content. Who's been repeating all that st hard stuff to you? I read it in a book, said Alice, but I had some poetry repeated to me, which much was easier than that, but Tweedledee, I think it was. As to poetry, you know, said Humpty Dumpty, stretching out one of his great hands. I can repeat poetry as well as other folk, if it comes to that. Oh, it needn't come to that, Alice said hastily, hoping to keep him from beginning. The piece I'm going to repeat, he went on without noticing her remark, was written entirely for your amusement. Alice felt that in that case she really ought to listen to it, so she sat down and said thank you rather sadly. In winter, when the fields are white, I sing this song for your delight, only I don't sing it, he added as an explanation. I see you don't, said Alice. If you could see whether I'm singing or not, you've sharper eyes than most, Humpty Dumpty remarked severely. Alice was silent. In spring, when woods are getting green, I'll try and tell you what I mean. Thank you very much, said Alice. In summer, when the days are long, perhaps you'll understand the song. In autumn, when the leaves are brown, take a pen and ink and write it down. I will, if I can remember it so long, said Alice. You needn't go on making remarks like that, Humpty Dumpty said. They're not sensible, and they put me out. 
I sent a message to the fish. I told them this is what I wish. The little fishes of the sea. They sent an answer back to me. The little fish's answer was, we cannot do it, sir, because I'm afraid I don't understand, said Alice. It gets easier further on, Humpty Dumpty replied. I sent to them again to say, it will be better to obey. The fishes answered with a grin. Why, that's a temper you are in. I told them once. I told them twice. They would not listen to advice. I took a kettle large and new, fit for the deed. I had to do. My heart went hop. My heart went thump. I filled the kettle at the pump, then someone came to me and said, the little fishes are in bed. I said to him, I said in plain that you must wake them up again. I said it very loud and clear. I went out and shouted in his ear. Humpty Dumpty raised his voice almost to a scream as he repeated this verse, and Alice thought with a shudder, I wouldn't have been the messenger for anything. But he was very stiff and proud. He said, you needn't shout so loud, and he was very proud and stiff. He said, I'd go and wake them if... I took a corkscrew from the shelf and went to wake them up myself, and when I went to the door, it was locked. I pulled and pushed and kicked and knocked, and when I found the door was shut, I tried to turn the handle, but there was a long pause. Is that all? Alice asked timidly. That's all, said Humpty Dumpty. Goodbye. This was rather sudden, Alice thought, but after such a very strong hint that she ought to go be going, she felt it would hardly be civil to stay, so she got up and held out her hand. Goodbye. Till we meet again, she said very carefully as she stood. I shouldn't know you again if we did meet, Humpty Dumpty replied in a discontented tone, giving her one of the fingers to shake. You're so exactly like other people. The face is what one goes by generally, Alice remarked in a thoughtful tone. That's just what I complain of, said Humpty Dumpty. Your face is the same as everybody else's who has two eyes, so marking their place in the air with his thumb, nose in the middle, mouth under, it's always the same. Now, if you had two eyes on the same side of the mouth, nose, for instance, or the mouth on the top, that would be the some help. It wouldn't be look nice, Alice objected, but Humpty Dumpty only shut his eyes and said, wait till you've tried. Alice waited a minute to see if she could speak again, but as he never opened his eyes or took any further notice of her, she said goodbye once more and getting no answer to this. She quietly walked away, but she couldn't help herself to say, as she went, of all the unsatisfactory, she repeated this aloud, as if it was a great comfort to have such a long word to say, of all the unsatisfactory people I ever met. She never finished the sentence, for at this moment a heavy crash shook the forest from end to end. Chapter 7. The Lion and the Unicorn the next moment, soldiers came running through the wood, at first in twos and threes, then ten or twenty together, and at last in such crowds that they seemed to fill the whole forest, Alice got behind a tree for fear of being run over and watched them go by. She thought that in all her life she had never seen soldiers so uncertain on their feet. They were always tripping over something or other, and whenever one went down, several more fell over him, so that the ground was soon covered with little heaps of men. Then came the horses, having four feet, these managed rather better than the foot soldiers, but even they stumbled now and then, so it seemed to be a regular rule that whenever a horse stumbled, the rider fell off instantly. The confusion got worse every minute, and Alice was very glad to get out of the wood into an open place where she found the white king seated on the ground, busily writing in his memorandum book. I've sent them all, the king cried in a tone of delight on seeing Alice. Did you happen to meet any soldiers, my dear, as you came through the wood? Yes, I did, said Alice. Several thousand, I should think. Four thousand two hundred and seven, that's the exact number, the king said, referring to his book. I couldn't send all the horses, you know, because two of them were unwanted in the game, and I haven't sent the two messengers either. They're both gone to the town. Just took the long road, and tell me if you can see either of them. I see nobody on the road, said Alice. I only wish I had such eyes, the king remarked in a fretful tone. To be able to see nobody, and at that distance too, why, it's such as much as I can do to see people, but this is the light. And all this was lost on Alice, who was still looking intently down the road, shading her eyes with one hand. I see somebody now, she exclaimed at last. But he's coming very slowly, and what curious attitudes he goes into, for the messenger kept skipping up and down and wriggling like an eel as he came along, with his great hands spread out like fans on each side. Not at all, said the king. He's an Anglo-Saxon messenger, and those are Anglo-Saxon attitudes. He only does them when he's happy. His name is Haya. He pronounced it so as a rhyme with mayor. I love my love with an H. Alice couldn't help.
beginning because he is happy. I hate him with an H because he is hideous. I fed him with his, with ham sandwiches and hay. His name is Haya, and he lives he lives on the hill, the king remarked simply, without the least idea that he was joining in the game, while Alice was still hesitating for the name of the town beginning with H. The other messengers called Hatta. I must have two, you know, to come and go, one to come and the other to go. I beg your pardon, said Alice. It isn't respectable to beg, said the king. I only meant that I didn't understand, said Alice. Why one to come and one to go? Don't I tell you? The king repeated impatiently. I must have two to fetch and carry, one to fetch and one to carry. At this moment, the messenger arrived. He is far too much out of breath to say a word and could only wave his hands about and make the most fearful faces at the poor king. This young lady loves you with an H, the king said, introducing Alice in the hope of turning off the messenger's attention from himself. But it was no use. The Anglo-Saxon attitudes only got more extraordinary every moment. While the great eyes rolled wildly from side to side, you alarm me, said the king. I feel faint. Give me a ham sandwich. On which the messenger, to Alice's great amusement, opened a bag that hung around his neck and handed the sandwich to the king, who devoured it greedily. Another sandwich, said the king. There's nothing but hay left now, the messenger said, peeping into the bag. Hay, then, the king murmured in a faint whisper. Alice was glad to see it revived him a good deal. There's nothing like eating hay when you're faint, he remarked to her as he munched away. I should think throwing out cold water where you would feel would be better, Alice suggested, or some sal volatile. I didn't say there was nothing better, the king replied. I said there was nothing like it, which Alice did not venture to deny. Who did you pass on the road, the king went on, holding out his hand to the messenger for more hay. Nobody, said the messenger. Quite right, said the king. This young lady saw him too, so of course nobody walks slower than you. I do my best, the messenger said in a sullen tone. I'm sure nobody walks much faster than I do. He can't do that, said the king, or else he'd have been here first. However, now you've got your breath. You may tell us what's happened in town. I'll whisper it, said the messenger, putting his hands to his mouth in the shape of a trumpet and stooping so as to get close to the king's ear. Alice was sorry for this, so she wanted to hear the news too. However, instead of whispering, he simply shouted at the top of his voice, they're at it again. Do you call that a whisper, cried the poor king, jumping up and shaking himself. If you do such a thing again, I'll have you buttered. It went through and through my head like an earthquake. It would have to be a very tiny earthquake, thought Alice. Who are at it again, she ventured to ask. Why the lion and the unicorn, of course, said the king. Fighting for the crown? Yes, to be sure, said the king. And the best of the joke, it's my crown. All the while, let's run and see them. And they trotted off. So Alice repeated herself as she ran the words of the old song. The lion and the unicorn were fighting for the crown. The lion beat the unicorn all around the town. Some gave them white bread. Some gave them brown. Some gave them plum cake and drummed them out of town. Does the one that wins get the crown, she asked, as well as she could, for the run was putting her out of her breath. Dear me, no, said the king. What an idea. Would you be enough? Alice panted out, running after a little farther. To stop a minute just to get one's breath again? I'm good enough, the king said. Only I'm not strong enough, you see. A minute goes by so fearfully quick. You might as well try to stop a bandersnatch. Alice had no more breath for talking. So they trotted on in silence till they came in sight of a great crowd in the middle of which the lion and unicorn were fighting. They were in such a cloud of dust that at first... Alice could not make out which was which, but soon managed to distinguish the unicorn by his horn. They placed themselves close to where Hatta, the other messenger, was wa standing, watching the fight with a cup of tea in one hand and a piece of bread and butter in the other. He's only just out of prison, and he hadn't finished his tea when he was sent in, Haya whispered to Alice, and they only give him oyster shells in there, so you see he's very hungry and thirsty. What? Why are you... Dear child, he went on, putting his arm affectionately around Hatta's neck. Hatta looked round and nodded, and went on with his bread and butter. Were you happy in prison, dear child, said Haya. Hatta looked round once more, and at this time a tear or two trickled down his cheek, but not a word would he say. Speak, can't you, Haya cried impatiently, but Hatta only munched away and drank some more tea. Speak, won't you, cried the king. How are they getting on with the fight? Hatta made a desperate effort and swallowed a large piece of bread and butter. They're getting on very well, he said, choking. Each of them has been down about 87 times. Then I suppose they'll soon bring the white bread the white bread and the brown. Alice ventured to remark, it's waiting for him now, said Hatta. This is a bit of it as I'm eating. 
There was a pause in the fight just then, and the lion and the unicorn sat down panting while the king called out ten minutes aloud for refreshments. Haya and Hatta set to work at once carrying round trays of white brown bread. Alice took a piece to taste, but it was very dry. I don't think they'll fight any more today, the king said to Hatta. Go and order the drums to begin. And Hatta went bounding away like a grasshopper. For a minute or two, Alice stood silent watching him. Suddenly she brightened up. Look up. Look she cried, pointing eagerly. There's the white queen running across the country. She came flying out of the wood over yonder. How fast those queens can run. There's some enemy after her, no doubt, the king said, without even looking round. That's woods, full of them. But aren't you going to run and help her? Alice asked, not very much surprised at his taking it so quietly. No use, no use, said the king. She runs so fearfully quick, you might as well try to catch a bandersnatch. But I'll make a memorandum about her if you like. She's a dear good creature, he repeated softly to himself as he opened his memorandum book. Do you spell creature with a double E? At this moment, the unicorn sauntered by them with his hands in his pockets. I had the best of it by this time, he said to the king, just glancing at him as he passed. A little, a little, the king replied, never nervously. You shouldn't have run him through with your horn, you know. I didn't hurt him, the unicorn said carelessly as he was going on. When his eyes happened to fall upon Alice, he turned round instantly and stood for some time, looking at her with an air of the deepest disgust. What is this, he said at last. This is a child, Haya replied eagerly, coming in front of Alice to introduce her and spreading out both his hands towards her in an Anglo-Saxon attitude. We only found it today. It's as large as life and twice as natural. I always thought there was fabulous man monsters, said the unicorn. Is it alive? It can talk, said Haya solemnly. The unicorn looked dreamily at Alice and said, Talk, child? Alice could not help her lips curling up into the smile as she began. Do you know, I always thought unicorns were fabulous monsters, too. I never saw one alive before. Well, now that we have seen each other, said the unicorn, if you'll believe me, I'll believe in you. It's that a bargain. Yeah, it is if you like, said Alice. Come, fetch out that plum cake, old man, the unicorn went on, turning from her to the king. None of your brown bed for me. Certainly, certainly, the king muttered and beckoned to Haya. Open the bag, he whispered, quick, not that one, that's full of hay. Haya took a large cake out of the bag and gave it to Alice to hold while she got out a cake dish and a carving knife. How they all came out of it, Alice couldn't guess. It was just like conjuring a trick, he thought. The lion had joined them while this was going on. He looked very tired and sleepy, and his eyes were half shut. What's this, he said, blinking lazily as Alice, and speaking in a deep, hollow tone that sounded like a tolling of a great bell. Ah, what is it now, the unicorn cried eagerly. You'll never guess. I couldn't. The lion looked at Alice wearily. Are you animal or vegetable or mineral? he said, yawning at every word. It's a fabulous monster, the unicorn cried out before Alice could reply. Then hand round the plum cake monster, the lion said, laying down and putting his chin on his paws, and sit down both of you to the king and the unicorn. Play fair with the cake, you know. The king was evidently very uncomfortable with the idea of having to sit down between the two great creatures, but there was no other place for him. What a fight we might have for a crown now, the unicorn unicorn said, looking slyly at the crown, which was the poor king was nearly shaking off his head. He was trembling so much. I should win easy, said the lion. I'm not sure of that, said the unicorn. Why, I'd beat you all around the town, you chicken, the lion replied angrily, half getting up as he spoke. Here the king interrupted to prevent the quarrel going on. He was nervous, and his voice quite quivered. All around the town, he said. That's a good long way. Did you go by the old bridge or the marketplace? You get the best view by all the old bridge. I'm sure I don't know, the old the lion growled as he lay down again. There was too much dust to see anything. What a time this monster is, cutting up the cake. Alice had seated herself on the bank of a little brook with the great dish on her knees and was sawing away diligently with the knife. It's very provoking, she said. In reply to the lion, she was getting used to being called the monster. I've got several slices already, but they always join on again. So, you don't know how to manage looking glass cakes, the unicorn replied. Hand it over first and cut it afterwards. This sounds nonsense, but Alice very obediently got up and carried the dish round, and the cake divided itself into three pieces as she did so. Now cut it up, said the lion as she returned to her place with the empty dish. I say, this isn't fair, cried the unicorn as Alice sat with the knife in her hand, very much puzzled how to begin. The monster was given the lion twice as much as me. She's kept none for herself anyhow, said the lion. Do you take plum cake, my monster? But before Alice could answer him, the drums began. Where the noise came from, she couldn't make out. The air seemed full of it, and it rang through the air, through her head like she felt quite dead.
deafened. She started to her feet and sprang across the little brook in her terror and had just the time to see the lion and unicorn rise to her feet with angry little looks at being interrupted in their feast before she dropped to her knees and put her hands over her ears, vainly trying to shut out the dreadful stupor. If that doesn't drum them out of town, she thought to herself, nothing ever will. Chapter 8, it's my own invention. After a while, the noise seemed gradually to die away till all that was dead silence, and Alice lifted up her head in some alarm. There was no one to be seen, and her first thought was that she must have been dreaming about the lion and the unicorn and the queer Anglo-Saxon messengers. However, there was the great dish still lying at her feet on which she had tried to cut the plum cake. So I wasn't dreaming after all, she said to herself, unless, unless we're all part of the same dream. Only I do hope it's my dream and not the Red King's. I don't like belonging in another person's dream, she went on in a rather complaining tone. I have a great mind to go and wake him up and see what happens. At this moment, her thoughts were interrupted by a loud shouting of a hoy, hoy, check, and a knight dressed in a crimson armor came galloping down her, brandishing a great club. Just as he reached her, the horse stopped suddenly. You're my prisoner, the knight cried as he tumbled off his horse. Startled as she was, Alice was more frightened for him than for herself at the moment and watched him with some anxiety as he mounted again. As soon as he was comfortably in the saddle, he began once more. You're my... But here another voice broke in. Ahoy, ahoy, check. And Alice looked round in some surprise for the new enemy. This time it was the white knight. He drew up at Alice's side and tumbled off his horse just as the red knight had done. Then he got on again and the two knights sat and looked at each other for some time without speaking. Alice looked from one of the other in some bewilderment. She's my prisoner, you know, the Red Knight said at last. Yes, but then I came and rescued her, the White Knight replied. Well, we must fight for her then, said the Red Knight, and he took off his helmet, which hung from the saddle and was something of the shape of the horse's head, and put it on. You will observe the rules of battle, of course, the White Knight remarked, putting on his helmet too. I always do, said the Red Knight. And they began bringing way at each other with such fury that Alice got behind a tree to be out of the way of the blows. I wonder now what the rules of battle are, she said to herself as she watched the fight timidly peeping out from under her hiding place. One rule seems to be that if the knight knits the other, he knocks him off his horse, and if he misses, he tumbles him off himself. And another rule seems to be that they hold their clubs with their arms as if they were punching Judy. What a noise they make when they tumble, just like a whole set of fire irons falling into the fender, and how quiet their horses are. They let them go on and off just like they were tables. Another rule of battle that said Alice, as she had noticed, seemed to be that they always fell on their heads and the battle ended with them both falling on this way side by side when they got up again, shook their heads, and the red knight mounted and galloped off. It was a glorious victory, wasn't it, said the white knight as he came up panting. I don't know, Alice said doubtfully. I don't want to be anybody's prisoner. I want to be a queen. So you will when you've crossed the next brook, said the white knight. I'll see you safe to the end of the wood, and then I must go back, you know. That's the end of my move. Thank you very much, said Alice. May I help you off with your helmet? It was evidently more than he could manage by himself. However, she managed to shake him out of it at last. Now one can breathe more easily, said the knight, putting it back his shaggy hair with both hands. And turning his gentle face and large, mild eyes to Alice, she thought she had never seen such a strange-looking soldier in all her life. He was dressed in a tin armor, which seemed to be fit him very badly, as he had a queer-shaped little deal box fastened across his shoulders upside down with his lid hanging open. Alice looked at it with great curiosity. I see you're admiring my little box, the king said in a fright friendly tone. It's my own invention to keep clothes and sandwiches in. You see, I carry upside down so that the rain can't get in, but things can get out gently, Alice reminded. Do you know the lid's open? I didn't know it, the knight said, a shade of vexation passing over his face. Then all the things must have fallen out, and the box is no use without them, he fastened it as he spoke and was just going to throw it into the bushes when a sudden thought seemed to strike him, and he hung it carefully on a tree. Can you guess why I did that, he said to Alice. Alice shook her head. In hopes some bees may make a nest in it, then I should get the honey. But you've got a beehive or something like one fastened to the saddle, said Alice. Yes, it's a very good beehive, said the, the knight in a discontented tone. One of the best kind. But not a single bee has come near it yet. And the one thing that a mouse trap, I suppose the mouse keeps the bees out, or the bees keep the mice out, I don't know which. I was wondering what the mouse trap was for, said Alice. It isn't very likely that there would be any mouse on the horse's back. Not very likely, perhaps, said the knight, but they, if they do come, I don't choose to have them running all about. You see, he went on after a pause. It's as well to be provided for everything, 
That's the reason the horse has all those anklets out around his feet. But what are, the, what are they for? Alice asked in a tone of great curiosity. To guard against the bites of sh sharks, the knight replied. It's an invention of my own. And now help me on. I'll go with you to the end of the wood. What's that dish for? It's meant for plum cake, said Alice. We better take it with us, the knight said. It'll come in handy if we find any plum cake. Help me to get it into this bag. This took a long time to manage, though Alice held the bag open very carefully because the knight was so very awkward in putting in the dish the first two or three times that he tried to. He fell himself instead. It's rather a tight fit, you see, he said, as they got it in at last. There are so many candlesticks in the bag, and he hung it to the saddle which was already loaded with bunches of carrots and fire irons and many other things. I hope you've got your hair well fastened on, he continued as they set off. Only in the usual way, Alice said, smiling. That's hardly enough, he said anxiously. You see, the wind is so very strong here, it's as strong as soup. Have you invented a plan for keeping for hair from being blown off, Alice inquired. Not yet, said the knight, but I've got a plan for keeping it from falling off. I should like to hear it very much. First you get an upright stick, said the, Al said the knight. Then you make your hair creep up it like a fruit tree. Now the reason hair falls off is because it hangs down. Things never fall upwards, you know. It's a plan of my own invention. You may try it if you like. I didn't... It didn't sound a comfortable plan, Alice thought, and for a few minutes she walked on in silence, puzzling over the idea and every now and then stopping to help the poor knight, who certainly was not a good rider. Whenever the horse stopped, which it did very often, he fell off in front, and whenever it went on again, which it generally did rather suddenly, he fell off behind. Otherwise he kept on pretty well, except that he had a bit of habit of now and then falling off sideways, as he generally did this on the side which Alice was walking. She soon found that it was the best plan not to walk quite close to the horse. I'm afraid you've not had much practice in riding, she ventured to say as she was helping him up with his fifth tumble. The knight looked very much surprised and a little offended at the remark. What makes you say that, he asked as he scrambled back into the saddle, keeping hold of Alice's hair with one hand to save himself from falling over in the other side. Because people don't fall off quite so often when they've had much practice. I've had plenty of practice, said the knight very gravely. Plenty of practice. Alice could think of nothing better to say than indeed, but she did it as heartily as she could. They went on a little way in silence after this, the knight with his eyes shut, muttering to himself, and Alice watching anxiously for the next tumble. The great thing, uh, art of riding. The knight suddenly began in a loud voice, waving his arms right in front as he spoke, is to keep. Here the sentence ended as he suddenly as it had begun. As the knight fell heavily on the top of his head, exactly in the path where Alice was walking, she was quite frightened this time, and said in an anxious tone as she picked him up, I hope no bones are broken, none to speak of, the knight said, as if he didn't mind breaking two or three of them. The great art of riding, as I say, is to keep your balance properly, like this, you know. He held the bright... He let go of the bridle and stretched out both his arms to show Alice what he meant. And this time he fell back on his back, right under the horse's feet. Plenty of practice, he went on repeating the plenty time that Alice was getting on his feet again. Plenty of practice. It's too ridiculous, cried Alice, losing all her patience. This time you ought to have a wooden horse on heels. That you ought. Does that kind of go smoothly, the knight asked, in a tone of great interest, clasping his arms round the horse's neck as he spoke, just in time to save himself from tumbling off again. Much more smoothly than a live horse, Alice said in a little scream of laughter in spite of all she could do to prevent it. I'll get one, the knight said thoughtfully to himself, one or two, several. There was a short silence after this, and then the knight went on again. I'm a great hand at inventing things. Now, I dare say you noticed the last time you picked me up that I was looking rather thoughtful. You were a little grave, said Alice. Well, just then I was inventing a new way of getting over a gate. Would you like to hear it? Very much indeed, Alice said politely. I'll tell you how I, I came to think of it, said the knight. You see, I said to myself, the only difficulty is with the feet. The head is high enough already. Now, first I put my head on top of the gate, then the head's high enough, then I stand on my head, then the feet are high enough, you see, then I'm over, you see. Yes, I suppose you'd be over when that was done, Alice said thoughtfully, but don't you think it would be rather hard? I haven't tried it yet, the knight said gravely, so I can't tell for certain, but I'm afraid it would be a little hard. He looked so vexed at the idea that Alice changed the subject hastily. What a curious helmet you've got, she said cheerfully. Is that your invention, too? The knight looked down profoundly at his helmet, which was hung from the saddle. Yes, he said, but I've invented a better one than that, like a sugar loaf. 
When I used to wear it, if I fell off the horse, it always touched the ground directly, so I had a very little to fall to, you see. And there was the danger of falling into it, to be sure, that happened to me once. And the worst of it was, before I got, could get out again, the other white knight came and put it on. He thought it was his own helmet. The knight looked so solemnly about it that Alice did not dare to laugh. I'm afraid you must have hurt him, she said in a trembling voice, being on top of his head. I had to kick him, of course, the knight said very seriously, and then he took the helmet off again. But it took hours and hours to get me out. I was as fast as lightning, you see. But that's a different kind of fastness, Alice objected. The knight shook his head. It was all kinds of fatness, fastness with me, I can assure you, he said. He raised his hands. In some excitement, as he said this, and instantly rolled out of the saddle and fell headlong into a deep ditch. Alice ran to the side of the ditch to look for him. She was rather startled by the fall. For some time, he kept on very well and was afraid that he really was hurt this time. However, though she could see nothing of the soles of his feet, she was much more relieved to hear that he was talking on his usual tone. All kinds of fastness, he repeated, but it was careless of him to put another man's helmet on with a man in it, too. How can you go on talking so quietly head downwards, Alice asked, as she dragged him by the feet and laid him in a heap on the bank. The knight looked surprised at the question. What does it matter where my body happens to be? My mind goes on working all the same. In fact, the more head downwards I am, the more I keep inventing new things. Now, the cleverest thing of the sort that I ever did, he went on after a pause when inventing a new pudding, pudding during the meat course. In time to have it cooked for the next course, as Alice? Well, that was a quick work, wasn't it? Well, not the next course, the knight said in a slow, thoughtful tone. No, certainly not the next course. Then it would have to be the next day, I suppose. You wouldn't have the two pudding courses in one dinner. Well, not the next day, the knight repeated as before. Not the next day. In fact, he went on holding his head down and his voice getting lower and lower. I don't believe that pudding ever was cooked. In fact, I don't believe that pudding ever will be cooked. And yet, it was a very clever pudding to invent. What did you mean it to be made of? Alice asked, hoping to cheer him up, for the poor knight seemed quite low-spirited about it. <coughs> I began with the blotting paper, the knight answered with a groan. That wouldn't be very nice, I'm afraid, not very nice alone, he interrupted quite eagerly. But you've got no idea what difference it makes mixing it with other things, such as gunpowder and sealing wax, and here I must leave you. They must have come to the end of the wood. Alice could only look puzzled. She was thinking of the pudding. You are sad, the knight said in an anxious tone. Let me sing you a song to comfort you. Is it a very long song, Alice asked, as she had heard a good deal of poetry that day. It's long, said the knight. But it's very, very beautiful. Everybody that hears me sing it, either that brings them tears into their eyes or else. Or else what, said Alice, for the night had made a sudden pause. Or else it doesn't, you know. The name of the song is called Haddock's Eyes. Oh, that's the name of the song, is it? Alice said, trying to feel interested. No, you don't understand, the knight said, looking a little vexed. That's what the name is called. The name is really the aged, aged man. Then I ought to have said... That's what the song is called, Alice corrected herself. No, you oughtn't. That's quite another thing. The song is called Ways and Means, but that's only what it's called, you know. Well, what is the song then, said Alice, who was by this time completely bewildered. I was coming to that, and the knight said, the song is really is a getting on a gate, and the tune's my own invention. So saying... He stopped his horse and let the reins fall on its neck, then slowly beating time with one hand and with a faint smile lighting up his gentle, foolish face as he enjoyed the music of his song, he began. Of all the strange things that Alice saw in her journey through the looking glass, this was the one that she always remembered most clearly. Years afterward, she could bring the whole scene back again as if she had only been yesterday. The mild blue eyes and kindly smile of the night, the setting sun gleaming through his hair and shining on his armor in a blaze of light that quite dazzled her. The horse quietly moving about with reins hanging loose on his neck, cropping the grass at her feet and the black f shadows of the forest behind. All this she took in like a picture as with one hand shading his eyes she leaned against a tree watching the strange pair and listening in half dream to the melancholy music of the song but the tune isn't his own invention she said to herself it's i give thee all i can no more 
She stood and listened very attentively, but no tears came into her eyes. I'll tell thee everything I can. There's little to relate. I saw an aged, aged man a sitting on a gate. Who are you, aged man? I said, and how is it like that you live? And his answer trickled through my head like water through a sieve. He said, I look for butterflies that sleep among the wheat. I make them into mutton pies and sell them in the street. I sell them unto men, he said, who sail on stormy seas. And that's the way I get my bread, a trifle if you please. But I was thinking of a plan to dye one's whiskers green and always use so large a fan that they could not be seen. So having no reply to give to what the old man said, I cried, come, tell me how you live and thumped him on the head. His accents mild took up the tale. He said, I go my ways and when I find a mountain trail, I set it in a blaze. And thence they make a stuff they call Roland's Massacre Oil. Yet two pence halfpenny is all they give to me for my toil. But I was thinking of a way to feed oneself on batter, and so go on from day to day getting a little fatter. I shook him well from side to side until his face was blue. Come, tell me how you live, I cried, and what it is you do. He said, I hunt for baddock's eyes among the heather bright, and work them into waistcoat buttons and the silent night, and these do not sell for gold or coin or silvery shine, but for a copper half bunny, and that will purchase nine. I sometimes dig for buttered rolls or set limited twigs for crabs. I sometimes search the grassy knolls for wheels of handsome cabs, and that's the way he gave a wink by which I gave my wealth, and very gladly will I drink your honor's noble health. I honor him then, for I had just completed my design to keep the menial bridge from rust by boiling it in wine. I thankful thanked him much for telling me the way he got his wealth, but chiefly for his wish that he might drink my noble health. And now if e'er by chance I put my finger into glue or madly squeeze a right hand foot into a left hand shoe, or if I drop upon my toe a very heavy weight, I weep, for it reminds me so that if old man I used to know, whose look was mild, whose speech was slow, whose hair was whiter than the snow, whose face was very like a crow, with eyes like cinders all aglow, who seemed distracted with his woe, who rocked his body to and fro and muttered mumblingly, and lo, as if his mouth were full of dough, who snorted like a buffalo that summer evening long ago a sitting on a gate. As the knight sang the last two words of the ballad, he gathered up the reins and turned his horse's head along the road by which they had come. You've only a few yards to go, he said, down to the hill and over that little brook, and then you'll be a queen. But you'll stay and see me first off, he said, as Alice turned an eager look in the direction of which he pointed. I shan't be long. You'll wait and wave your handkerchief when I get into turn and go up the road. I think it'll encourage me, you see. Of course I'll wait, said Alice, and thank you very much for coming so far, and for the song. I liked it very much. I hope so, the knight said doubtfully, but you didn't cry so much, and I thought you would. So they shook hands, and then the knight rode slowly away into the forest. It won't take long to see him off, I expect, Alice said to herself as she stood watching him. There he goes, right on his head as usual. However, he gets on again pretty easily. That comes of having so many things hung around the horse. So he went on talking to herself as she watched the horse walking leisurely along the road and the knight tumbling off first on one side and then the other. After the fourth or fifth tumble, he reached the turn and then she waved off her handkerchief to him and waited till he was out of sight. I hope it encouraged him, she said, as she turned to run down the hill. And now for the last brook and to be a queen. How grand it sounds. A very few steps brought her to the edge of the brook. The eighth square at last, she cried as she bounded across and threw herself down to rest on a lawn as soft as moss, with little flower beds dotted about here and there. Oh, how glad I am to get here, and what is this on my head? She exclaimed in a tone of dismay as she put her hands up to something very heavy that fitted tight all around her head. But how can it have got on there without my knowing, she said to herself as she lifted it off and set it on her lap to make out what it could possibly be. It was a golden crown. Chapter 9, Queen Alice. Well, this is grand, said Alice. I never expected I should be a queen so soon. I'll tell you what it is, your majesty, she went on in a severe tone. She was always rather fond of school.